Welcome to the Cross the Line Podcast. My name is Carlos Smith, and today's episode is sponsored by Charlene's Home Cooking, 1136 East Blackstock Road in Moore, South Carolina. Charlene's Home Cooking is a family restaurant that cooks like grandma with fresh veggies and meats cooked to order. You can do a meat with two sides, a meat with three sides, or a veggie plate along with sweet tea, Kool-Aid, and lemonade. Cakes, pies, and cobbler are also available for dessert. She wants you to feel at home anytime you visit, so make sure you stop by Monday, Thursday, and Saturday from 11 to 6, and Friday and Sunday from 11 to 7. Everything is fresh and from the heart, and she would love for you to visit. So thank you, Miss Charlene, for being a sponsor once again for the Cross the Line Podcast. Now today we are in Chester, South Carolina. Um, it has been a lot of social injustice going on, a lot of protesting been going on. So right now we're in Chester with the mayor of Chester, South Carolina, Ms. Wanda Stringfellow. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing just fine. I want to thank you. Um, you know, I reached out last week. I was telling you off camera that one of my friends um, that I went to school with at, at USC Upstate, she was started, um, she's from Chester, uh-huh. and she, she started sharing the uh, articles and the videos of what actually happened with the young man. Um, it was Eric? Aaron, Aaron, Aaron McCray. McCray. I want to mm-hmm. make sure I said it right, McCray. And uh, so I reached out to her. I, I, I commented on her post and I asked when it happened. She said it was back in November, mm-hmm. but they were just now releasing the footage of it. So once I once I started diving into it, I was like, it just didn't sit right with me. A lot of it didn't make sense and it still doesn't make right. sense to me. So I wanted to reach out to you and, and just have a conversation with you. And we'll, we'll talk about a lot of the social injustice that's been going on. But first, just want to tell, let people know more about you. So starting out, who is Miss Wanda Stringfellow? Oh, that's a difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> um, Wanda Stringfellow. I'm the daughter of a local minister, um, Reverend Bill Stringfellow, okay. and a um, teacher here in the community that taught well over 40 years in the Chester community, um, known as MC Stringfellow. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a sister, um, Billy Atta, and um, we are Chester natives grown, you know, born here, have lived here the majority of my life, um, and I have two children. I have a daughter, a Jessica, who's um, a practicing attorney, okay. and I have a 15-year-old son, Jaden, who will be a sophomore at Chester High School, um, and I like to brag about both of my children, right. but um, especially Jaden right now. He's a um, Duke Tilt Scholar, the oh, only one in the district. He's um, extremely smart, and so um, I have to send kudos out to them. Um, Wanda is the 56-year-old daughter of a minister and a teacher here mm-hmm. from Chester. Um, as I said, I grew up here in Chester. Chester um, is home, um, and Chester is where my heart is. Mm-hmm. I'm wanting to work to, to just improve the quality of life for the people that live here and to see things a lot better than they have been um, in previous years. Um, I am also a teacher. Um, I'm I'm a retired teacher, but a working retiree. I retired after 28 years of teaching and um, currently continues to teach science at the Chester Middle School, um, grade eight. So I think that that's important because I'm still able to have a direct contact with the youth of this community, Mm -hmm. which makes, um, in my opinion, a a very, very um, great difference in the way sometimes young people can see um, see reality and and their perspective on things and and just to get a different point of view from what you may ordinarily be accustomed to being um, associated with. So, I was going to ask, what what made you... um want to to become a teacher was it something just like all all your life you wanted to do was it something that <laughs> no all of my life i did not want to be a teacher um but it seems like every profession that i looked at my mother would go mm, you think you're really gonna like doing that that's gonna get old pretty soon but um deep down inside i ran from it teaching in my opinion is just like preaching there is a calling that you have. And if you aren't called to do it, you won't be successful at it. You can go through the motions, but you're not gonna have the impact that you need to have. So really and truthfully, teaching is my calling. Um, And and that's how I see it as such. And it's almost an extension of a ministry in the way that you can impact and affect lives. Absolutely. What do do you see as the biggest issue with uh, teaching today? Because for me, when I look at it, I think it's kind of like we're still 
the way that we learn, like kids learn today, is it's, it's kind of different in the sense of what it should be because, you know, the attention span of children now is not as long. And I probably shouldn't be saying this, but sometimes when my son comes home from school, he doesn't always want to do his homework, and it's just like he, he doesn't he does like he what he does he does his stuff he gets it done doesn't make good grades. But it's like I guess it's the way that they learn now, and it's like. I want to get mad at him. I try to stay on him, like which I do stay on him by doing his homework. But at the same time, I'm like, I kind of get it because the the old way of learning is just like something for kids. Now they need something more active. Like if it's some kind of creative way for them to learn, then I feel like it's better for them. But but what would you say is like the biggest issue that you see in the school system? Okay, you said a couple of things that I want to touch on. Okay. Um, and I, I want to start with your sign, for example. Mm -hmm. Um making sure what I did with my children is when they got home from school they didn't have to immediately go into homework. Mm -hmm. You get one hour and that hour is for you if you want to take a nap you can sleep that hour. If you want to break it up 30 minutes you take a nap, 30 minutes you watch your favorite cartoon or you play your video game but you know that that one hour belongs to you Absolutely. and once that hour is up we get the business. Um, and the business at hand is that we review what you've learned for the day, we complete your homework, and we look at what you're supposed to learn for the next day so that when you walk in that room, you're not block walking into a blind spot. You're walking in prepared being able to tell that teacher, hey, I can answer that. I know the answer to that. I know how to work that math problem, mm -hmm. you know, because, and, and they're going to look at them baffled, how do you know? Because my parents, my dad sat down with me last night and um, he's got that, that confidence mm -hmm. that he needs to go into that room and be successful. I think um, probably one of the biggest challenges that we face today, you talked about the, the short attention span of children. And when I reflect back to when I was a child, then I look at the differences between my two children as they have grown. Um, I don't know if the attention span has gotten shorter, but if not, but rather the fact that the patience of the adults that are in charge have gotten, have, have grown and gotten a little more impatient. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that because of the, the age of modern technology, right. um, everybody wants it now. They want mm -hmm. that instant gratification. And children are so accustomed now to receiving that. When children are born from birth, parents put all these electronics and mobiles and everything up above their cribs Absolutely. and they're giving them these electronics. I see little children, they can't talk yet, but they're sitting there with their parents' cell phone or device mm -hmm. working. So I think that we, we have just become a society of people that wants instant gratification um, and to be able to push a button and it's there. Mm -hmm. um, also with regard to education, I think that um, I, basic, I actually believe in some basic fundamentals. I do a tutoring session and I call it Back to Basics. When we get it there, it's not children sitting down with computers or tablets and a lot of internet access. It's good old fashioned, here's your pencil, here's your paper, you look at this board and this is what we're working on. When it comes to reading, the, the achievement gap, and we're all hearing about the achievement gap and how African American children are trailing so far behind other children um, in our nation's schools. How do we close that gap? We've got to get back to some basics. We've got to get back to parents sitting down with their children and reading every day. Mm -hmm. Child doesn't want to read a book. That's tough. You're going to read this book. That's what my parents did for me. That's what I did for my children. And they are very, very um, successful academically. Um, so I giving too many choices to our children with regard to their education. You know, this is what you need, and having a formula for which to to get to it. This is what we're going to do to get you from A to B on up to Z to ensure that you're successful academically. So we've got to work on closing that achievement gap. And how do we do that? We do that with a commitment from our parents. Mm -hmm. um, parents have got to be more committed to the educational process of their children. Um, you got to get in those schools.
You got to know the teachers that are interacting with your children for eight hours or more a day. Um, you, you've got to know the curriculum and to use the excuse that all this new math, everything is new and I don't know it. There is no excuse not to know anything today because you've got the at the tip of a finger, Google. Google. Mm -hmm. That's right. You can find out a means to do it. And so with my tutoring, it's back to the basics. Children can't read if they don't if they don't know sight words, if they don't know mm -hmm. phonetically how to sound words out. Um, there are just some basic things that we've got to know that technology can't teach us. And it's gonna take sitting down with children. And you can I'm very passionate about education. Oh yes, man, I can tell. <laughs> well, one of the things that you were saying about parents being more involved, I'm, my te my aunt, she's a teacher at a, at a middle school, and I remember her telling us a long time ago, she said a lot of times when they have those PTO meetings, the parents won't show up. And she said the only time they'll show up is when they're ready to argue or fight about something, about saying the child didn't do something. Exactly. When the child really did do it, but that's the only time she said they'll be ready to come up there and, and right. show out at the school. But that's other than right. that, they, they're not coming. And typically, you see the parents of the children you don't need to see. Mm -hmm. um, every parent conference, I'm there. Um, my son's a straight-A student. He's a Duke Tip Scholar. Um, every summer he spent since the sixth grade either at Wake Forest or Duke and this summer he was supposed to be at Harvard um, mm -hmm. to do a shadowing program for surgeons for um, young future medical um, professionals but because of the COVID-19 right. um, I made a decision to, to withdraw him from doing that mm -hmm. but we've got to get parents more engaged if we're going to gotcha. see a significant difference and what's taking place with our children. Absolutely, and that's one of the things with, with, when the COVID-19 took place, the, the virus, uh, I had to learn a lot of patience my own self because now we have to start teaching at home. And then so, like I said, with kids, with this technology, they get hooked on tablets and video games. Right. So we would, we would try to break it down, he'll go, let him play a little bit, come back, do some homework, and then, you know, we'll play again, try not, try not to put it all together for him because it was kind of hard for him to like, just sit down and focus, but then at times he would, he didn't want to come back to do his homework right. because he's right. you know, playing the game, so I had to take a tablet or anything just to, to get him to get locked back in. But something else I want to talk about mm -hmm. also was like one of the issues with the school system is, and we, we've been talking about it a lot a lot more lately, is we didn't necessarily learn about our history growing up. We, they talked about Dr. King and Rosa Parks and Harry Tubman, but they didn't really dive into all of our history like we should, do you feel like that's something they should do and incorporate more of? Like like one of my favorite people that I've been studying is Malcolm X. And I couldn't even remember anything that they ever said about Malcolm X. I didn't learn learn anything about him until I started reading up on him and I watched the movie. Do you feel like there's something they should do to teach more about our history as well in school? Absolutely, without a doubt. Um, when I was in high school, I took black history, I took black literature. Um, and those teachers I can remember vividly and the lessons that they taught. It also gives us, when children are taught black history, it gives us a sense of who we are. And you become proud of those founding fathers, so to speak. And we know whose shoulders we stand on because all of us are standing on the shoulders of someone else that has made sacrifices in order for us to have achieved what it is that we are. Um, achieving. So um, definitely that needs to be taught. One of the things that disappoints me the greatest, my son signed up to take a black history class um, this fall at Chester High School. Well, we, re we received a phone call a few weeks ago letting us know that the class was being canceled. Um, why is it being canceled? Um, there is no teacher to teach the class. Well, can another teacher be reassigned to teach the class? Um, because there were clearly children that signed up to take the course. Right. So, you know, we're in the process of trying to find more more classes or electives just to fill that space. Um, and it's unfortunate. I think that a lot of what's going on in America today mm -hmm. is that if every student, not just black kids, but every student was required to take black history courses just as South Carolina history is taught, U.S. history and world geography are taught, mm -hmm. then people would have a, a a greater perspective of the challenges that our country has gone through and what our people have gone through, and people will be more um, empathetic 
and um, to, to some of the issues and the society ills that exist. Just as we talk about the Holocaust mm -hmm. with the Jews, we should also talk about the Holocaust that took place with slavery, um, the atrocities that have taken place. Um, not to beat any particular sector of people down, but to say, hey, this is what has happened in the past. What happened to the Native Americans? Um, this is what has happened in the past. Mm -hmm. And if we don't address those past occurrences, we're doomed to repeat some of them. And we can see a vicious cycle that apparently be, is beginning to take place oh, yes. in America, um, which is a repeat of what has taken place previously in history. But if you don't know your history, and you don't know that these things have taken place, um, you think that it's new. All mm -hmm. the protesting that's going on is nothing new. Uh, okay. The demonstrations, nothing new. Um, social disrest and distrust of police is nothing new. All these things are things that have happened previously in history, but when you don't open a book, when you're mm -hmm. not having these conversations, um, when parents aren't teaching their children, my son, he wakes me up 2 o'clock in the morning sometimes, he's coming out, I got to share this with you, I just read this, did you know? And there are some things I know, but I'll go, no, say what? Mm -hmm. What can you tell me about that? Just to get him engaged in a conversation so that I know you didn't just glimpse it, but you actually read it. Right. And that you're understanding what you're reading. And now, now that you know this knowledge, how are you going to put it into play? Right. You know, what are you going to do? And I think a lot of it, to me, I, just my opinion, I think maybe they don't put it in there because it'll make them uncomfortable about discussing these type of things. But it's important because, like you said, if we don't learn about our history, then we'll, like, we'll never know about it. It's like, we'll just be wiped clean with history. Exactly. It's like they, they just give us a few of our, of our leaders, but then that's it. Like I said, like a Marcus Garvey or, or Malcolm X or people like that. Right. We don't learn about them in, um, in, in the school system, period. Do you think... Well, I ask you, are they trying to, are they going to put this back into the school system about the African American history or? You mean with reference to Chester, Chester High yes, School? Yes. Um, I have asked and I haven't received a definitive answer. Right now, the answer continues to be um, there isn't a teacher available to teach the course. Um, but of course, I will continue to ask the question until we get that course back on track because it's needed. Yeah, if absolutely. ever a class like that is needed, it's needed now. And, and there needs to be a teacher that's committed to teaching the history without any biases. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, this is what actually happened. And, and you know, you talk about making people uncomfortable. If things are going to change, people must come out of their comfort zones. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and um, a lot of people will say, well, um, you know, you got to think outside the box. I say, don't be a marginal thinker. You know, you just can't be a marginal thinker. You've, you've got to come out of your comfort zone and you've got to look at the bigger picture um, of how what we're doing right now is going to impact what happens years from now. Absolutely. So as the mayor, how, how much say-so do you have when it comes to things with the school system? I actually don't have any say oh, so no. with what goes on with the schools. Most people um, think that I do just because of what takes place in larger cities. Mm -hmm. In New York and some other places, the mayor has lots of control over what's going on in their schools. That's not the case here. As far as the schools are concerned, I am an employee of Chester County Schools. Okay. Um, I teach eighth grade science at Chester Middle School. and. Um, I was gonna say, yeah, you would. I would think that they would, especially working in the school system and being the mayor, that they would allow you to get some kind of input of, or what more that the school would absolutely need, since you you right there on the front line, like you educating the kids, right. and also as the mayor. So I feel right. like that would be a. I've always thought that there were some other ways that perhaps my skill set could be used, but you know that may just be me thinking. I, I might have some answers, you know, right. um, but not necessarily the way the school district may perceive it. But no, the mayor's job does not have anything um, okay. to do with the schools other than I'm a district employee. Okay. So, so what made you um, want to, to run for mayor of Chester, especially being in the school system, and then what was it that made you want to 
I've all I've known since I was in the eighth grade that I was going to be the mayor of this city. And when I tell that story, a lot of people think, you know, she's full of it. But um, seriously, when I was in the eighth grade, something spoke to me. Um, and you know, if you believe in higher beings of God, um, that's just my connection. And um, something spoke to me when I was in the eighth grade and told me that I would be the mayor of the city. And I could actually see, I saw a vision of the city and it's sitting on the hill and it flourishing and the potential that the community has. Um, and, and since then, I've just been basically developing and trying to prepare myself um, to be at the helm of this community. Um, I even told my parents when, when I was in the eighth grade, I said, you know, one day I'm gonna be the mayor. And of course, my parents were always very, very supportive, particularly my dad. I get being civically involved and engage from him because from a very young age, probably about six or seven, when he was out and about um, campaigning, um, when he was going to marches and protests, I was holding on to his pant leg, um, you know, sliding right there behind him. The Ralph Abernathy's, um, the Joseph Lowry's of um, the SELC all of those leaders, the Golden Franks of the Civil Rights era, those were the people that I was sitting in the room with as a young child because I was there with my dad. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to civil rights and, and working for people and civic engagement, I grew up with it. My sister and I both. Um, it's just a, a, a part of the fabric that's ingrained in us. So, um, would, you, yeah. would you say it's hard to to balance being a teacher and the mayor at the same time, or how, how do you try to? It isn't. It really isn't. And that's because um, I enjoy what I do. That's the first thing. I love teaching. I absolutely love it. When I get into that room with those children, um, even when I'm in the school around and about, all the kids know me. Um, because I love being there, and I love the fact that I can positive, positively affect the lives of those children. Um, and then when it comes to being the mayor and being involved in government, I love government. I love the, the ins and outs of how it works. Um, I, I, I just love everything about it. And so someone told me once, you make being mayor look so easy. Um, and it's all because I, I enjoy what I'm doing. And secondly, it's because, as I told you previously, teaching is a calling. Um, I was told when I was in the 8th grade that I would be the mayor of this city, so I consider that to be another calling that has been placed on my life. It's just where God intended for me to be and, and, and to do, you know, within my lifetime. Absolutely. What would you say right now as the mayor, what would you say is your primary focus at the moment of running Chester? My primary focus um, at the moment is trying to bridge the gap between um, the police and the community, um, mm -hmm. wanting to rebuild the confidence of our community in our local police department and also government to say that we hear what you're saying, we we see what needs to be done within the community, and to to bring together the sectors that need to come together in order to um, to affect that change but primarily working for the good of the community with regard to maintaining peace. I believe in um, demonstration and protest. Anyone has the right to peacefully assemble. Um, and I, I emphasize peacefully. And so, but, but just bridging that gap and making sure that um, we're still doing things. People are, their civil um, liberties to, to gather and assemble and, and protest, not be happy with what's taking place and being said is okay, but yet we've got to have civility and um, and regaining the trust of the, the people and the police. Absolutely. Have, have there been any protests here in Chester? Or? There have been. There have been. Um, you know, Aaron McCree was killed November the 23rd, mm -hmm. and there were um, several marches that took place, not on a very large scale like we see in um, large cities. I'm actually quite surprised that the 
the turnout was not greater than it was. And since the um, George Floyd um, murder took place before us on national TV, mm -hmm. um, there have been a few other um, demonstrations of protest that have taken place. But again, not nearly on the scale that I would have thought that they would have um, been. Right. But um, there are some people that have stepped to the forefront to say, hey, look, we need to bring attention to this. And I think one of the things that's kind of really brought more attention to it is because we've seen with George Floyd, it's, it's very hard to watch what happened to him, but the thing is, with this virus, it's like a unique time because everything's shut down. There's no sports. You know, people will always say, I want to watch sports to get get my mind off of everything that's going on. So now that there's no sport, and you see these things, it's like people are finally paying attention to what's been going on to African Americans for so long. And I think that's something that's very different in this time and makes it bring more attention to it and heighten the level of sensitivity that's, that's been going on. Do you, do you think what George Floyd, what happened to George Floyd kind of made them go back and look at Mr. McCree's uh, situation again? Um, definitely. I, I think what happened with um, George Floyd has brought to the forefront the um, attention of many, many mm -hmm. um, unjust shootings or uh, murders across America. Um, at the hands of police um, and it's unfortunate that America had to watch a man die at the hands of a police basically his airways being um, co collapsing um, for lack of air and oxygen getting to the brain that it made people realize the issues that are going on in America um, and, and I guess as you said the blinders were on because we had so many things to keep us distracted. Mm -hmm. So if COVID-19 did anything positive, it did two things. It brought families together because you either love the people you were shut up with yeah. for all of those weeks, months, or, you know, it separated some families, you know. But it, it showed us what was really important. It brought families together. Um, it enabled you to be able to sit down at the dinner table with your family. Um, to have conversations that might not have ordinarily taken place because mm -hmm. people got tired of watching TV. So what else do you do? You talk to the people that are surrounding you. So yeah, I, I would definitely say that the George Floyd situation um, heightened the attention that Aaron McCree's case did receive. Um, in addition to the fact that it, it took almost seven months um, for video footage to be released and um, I don't think that video footage would have been released if the people that were at the forefront um, having the demonstrations and some folk just stepped to the front and said hey you know what we see George Floyd's video we see Ahmaud Aubrey's video um, we see what happened in all these other cities why can't we see what happened in Chester at the local Walmart, you know, parking lot? And so that definitely put it on a fast track to end, to develop momentum. Absolutely. I want to dive more into the Aaron McCree uh, situation because it was, like I said, to me it still doesn't sit right. Um, the thing is, um, on that footage and everything, it's just, why, why would it take, I know, of course they have protocols and everything, but but why would it take so long for the footage to come out? Or at least if you didn't want to release it to the public, at least was the family able to see the footage beforehand? Or, or did they have to wait until, you know, it came out to the public? Um, from what I, I am told, the, the family was, as the investigation was closed, and, and I haven't spoken directly to my cousin, so here all of this is by way of a word this person said, mm -hmm. but um, they, as the investigation was closed, the family was able to view the, um, the video. Um, also, in fairness to everyone involved, I'm told that the attorneys for the McCree family did indeed receive all the copies of any video that exists um, on March 20th, I believe it was. Um, and why their attorneys chose not to release the video once it was in their hands, I can't speak to that. Mm -hmm. I will also say that because um, Aaron is a relative of mine, 
um, the police chief was not willing to discuss the case with me. Mm -hmm. okay. um, there was a gag order of sort that I that was issued as to not discuss it with me, and um, on, I, I'm told that that could be because um, perhaps they felt like my family would be coming to me to get information that I may be feeding to them. And my answer and my reply to that is, my integrity means a lot to me. Absolutely. And I took a vow and an oath when I was sworn in as the mayor of this community that I will always uphold. And so there is no compromising that. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not a person of, of, of compromise when it comes to my integrity. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't even know why that would have been a thought for anyone that, that even knows anything about me. I'm a very straightforward, candid person. My candor sometimes can get me in trouble. But um, I definitely would never compromise my integrity and the oath that I took to the city. Um, and, you know, I found out about the release of the video by way of a friend of mine, a co-worker that sent me a, uh, what do you call it, a snapshot mm -hmm. of a headline in the newspaper mm -hmm. that says, breaking news. Chief of Police releases McCree video footage um, to the news media and the news media had already posted the steel pictures and had already posted the video. I'm calling City Hall to the city administrator going, well hey, why didn't you tell me about this? And she's going, what are you talking about? And so I'm like, well I'm going to send you something. So I pull over, um, send her a snapshot because I'm riding trailing at the um, sanitation department, showing them some things that I think needs to be done, and I get this message. Mm -hmm. And she goes, hey, I didn't know anything about that. And I'm like, well, you need to get the chief on the phone. Let's find out what's going on. Why didn't he notify us? Well, at that point, it's about 1.30. Um, she says, oh, I just got an email from the chief saying that he was uh, giving the information to the local newspaper after he's released it. So when I viewed that video, it was after many people in the public had already seen it. So there wasn't, and, and something that I've always, I've had to work on clearing up with our community is, it wasn't that I got privy to the video back in March or back in November. I saw the footage after many of our residents saw it once the um, local newspaper released it. And then, you know, sent the chief an email saying, um, on last Thursday is the day that he released it. Um, I'm on my way to City Hall. I'd like to view the video right now. Uh, I don't want to wait until tomorrow or next week. I want to view it right now because I, I'm going to be the person that the people are going to be contacting with reference to what happened in that video. I at least need to see it and, um, and hear, have some conversation with you regard to what's happening so that I know how to respond. Absolutely, and like you said, the, the, the attorneys received the footage in March, but still, it's, to me, it's still that time frame from November until March. Well, how do we know? Not accusing, I'm not accusing them of anything, but how do we know from from November to March anything could have been altered with the footage, or like they're saying, it's uh they're missing some footage, or like the officer didn't have a, that the camera on, and and for some reason the footage it's no audio, and to me, I'm thinking. With all this equipment, you can get the most basic smartphone, and once you record, it has audio. So how come we don't have audio with this video footage? To me, it's just like it's, it just doesn't add up because you should it should already have audio. I think, just my personal opinion, maybe it's something that was said during that video that they wanted to leave out to let you know it was something personal, maybe because it it just doesn't make sense that you can you can go buy a phone from Walmart, a basic smartphone from Walmart and push record and it's going to have audio. So how come with all the dogs that's poured into the police department that they don't have audio with the footage? To me, that just doesn't add up. And that doesn't add up to a lot of us. Mm -hmm. it, it leaves lots of questions. Um, and the speculation that is something being said that you don't want the citizens to hear um, is one of the buzz questions that's circulating through the community. Why isn't there audio? And I think when we talk about technology and just having everything at the at your fingertip, there that's inexcusable. There is no excuse. Um, instead of 
my opinion would be, I've only been re-elected as mayor um, for a year, I believe it was May 9th. But however, if before you hired more officers, it would have been more important to make sure that you had the most up-to-date equipment. Yeah, because we're told that this, I don't know if whether it's a two minute delay or a one and a half minute delay because it, it has changed as the conversation changes. Um, but there is no excuse for that. Nowhere else in the United States do, do we find this, that there's a two minute delay in recording, which could have been prevented. Had the officer cut on his body cam right into exiting the car. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, and I'm told, well, that's to, pr to protect the privacy of anything that the police officer may have been doing, a conversation they had going on before exiting the car. What are you doing in the public taxpayer's car that you need protection from? Exactly. It's a that, lot of that you couldn't cut on your body cam. Mm -hmm. So, no matter how you look at it, it's inexcusable. Absolutely. It's and I, I wrote down a, a lot of different things when I was reading the article. And this, all of this came from Post and Curry. It said Baker and Richardson told their supervisor McCree fired at them, but then walked back the statement. And then when investigators tried to question them, but when investigators tried to question them, they requested an attorney. Now Sergeant Nichols, I don't know if you knew this part or not, searched McCree's pockets and patted and patted his jeans down to his ankles. And then Richardson stepped out, and Harris told investigators he was headbutted. And also from Harris. He was a 10-year vet with no vest or body cam on, but he was warned back when he worked in Clover, South Carolina, at the Clover Police Department. He had three separate incidents about failing to activate his video camera. So that was three separate incidents back when he worked in Clover where he had the same thing. So the third, that was three times then, and then you had another incident now. So four times, that's not just an accident, in my personal opinion. No, that's not just an accident. Mm -hmm. That's an officer that, in my opinion, intends to do what he wants to do and does not want a record of what he's doing or saying to the citizens. Absolutely. And I want to say again, this information that I'm reading, it came from the Post and Courier. Uh, it's not my information that I'm just putting out there. I did read it's, that article. Yeah, it's, yes. It was something, he, and he was the one that was headbutted by McCree. So to me, I felt like maybe he felt threatened and, and, and uh, uh, trying to figure out more, angry that he was headbutted by McCree. And he was also the one that said he got a gun and shots fired. So then he was the one who they said that he shot, what was it, Harris shot 11 times and Baker, Officer Baker fired 13 rounds. So Harris was the one who got headbutted. So he fired 11 shots. So maybe that was from retaliation from being headbutted earlier in that situation. But that was, but to me, it just, to me, that just doesn't make sense to where he's had all these incidents where he hasn't had his body cam on and then this made it a fourth time. So it's like, he should know by this time, like working in law enforcement this long, that he should have it on. So it, exactly. it just doesn't add up. It's inexcusable. And that's why at the council meeting on last evening, I called for the termination of three officers. Mm -hmm. I called for the termination of Officer Harris, Officer Baker, and Officer Richardson, who was the officer that handcuffed McCree, and we're now told was not handcuffed properly. Um, those types of errors should not be made when you are training law enforcement officials. Yeah, There's no room for error. Um, in the society that we're living in, um, in the era of distrust for law enforcement. Mm -hmm. You've got to dot every I and cross every T. Um, number one, to ensure the safety of the public that you're entrusted to protect and serve. And also to ensure your safety and protection during any occurrence with um, a resident that you may encounter in trying to make an arrest. You know. Um, and I, I stated to council on last evening that my call for their termination was not based on the f black and white. The fact that a white officer killed a black man mm -hmm. um, has nothing to do with the fact that that is my cousin's child. Um, it has to do with the fact that um, the documents that I have here are copies of pages from the standard operation procedural manual that says every officer should have on their body cam exactly. and that went at the beginning of the encounter not in the middle and not at the end or not just at your discretion when you think you want to record what you need to record it says that at the beginning of that encounter the body cam should be engaged both audio and video and so that's not something that i made up 
That's what's in the standard operation procedures manual that every police officer for the city of Chester should be familiar with. And it's also the policy by which the chief of police should be enforcing. Um, now the chief wanted to say, well, um, it says may. There is no may. There is no may. Um, you, it is mandatory. It should be mandatory. Um, and any officer that has a previous record of it from a previous employer mm -hmm. and violating the same policy, and now you come here, you violate the policy, why are we <coughs> continuing to keep that going exactly. within the police department? And so um, that that's going to lead me to... Um, at this point, I, I really believe that it's in the best interest of the community that the chief of police resign. Absolutely, because it, it just, I, and I watched the press conference, um, I watched the video he did his live press conference. To me, he just, he didn't even look comfortable up there with the things that he was saying, and a lot of it didn't even make sense. And then they were saying that uh, we actually, the video where he tried to get an example of being handcuffed behind your back and then reaching around your side and, and trying to shoot. I, I don't know too many people that'll they can do that. Plus, the, he didn't have a holster on his hip to where he can right. reach and where it was him. sitting up there exactly. high, and then you can pull, actually pull the weapon from your holster. Exactly. Exactly. Right. exactly. And another thing that uh, Chief Williams was, was saying was that that and when he after he was shot, that the gun was they pulled it from his hand. But in the video, you look like the officer is tugging something from his hip. Mm -hmm. So it's like that that story doesn't even add up as well. To me, it was just like it's a lot of holes in the story. And then there's something else I read that it said the sled um, said they could partially see McCree going by his, his car and then Harris said he may have retrieved the gun from his car. How, how would he know that he went to his, his car anyway if you just chase him around? You don't you don't even know that part either. It's right. like it just right. it just doesn't make sense. And then to say Shots fired. I like. I feel like that's just an easy cop out. Of, cop out of saying, "Oh, black man with a gun. He, he's got a gun, so that gives him the leeway to just go ahead and shoot." Him. This is my opinion when I look at the situation. Yeah, and and, and it does. And you know, um, by no means if if Aaron um, did anything wrong, you know, as I said, wrong is wrong and right is right. Um, could he have probably made some better decisions? He probably could have on that day. But does any event that has taken place at Walmart on November 23rd warrant a death sentence? And in my answer, in my um, mind, the answer is absolutely not. That it should not have led to a death sentence at Walmart on November 23rd. Um, you know, you, you said something with regard to... Um, Harrison and um, I'm sorry being out there and and him running through the parking lot mm -hmm. at the point that Aaron McCree was running in the parking lot he wasn't a threat to anybody exactly. he was running you knew who he was you knew his address um, eventually he was gonna stop running eventually he was gonna go home and he's in handcuffs and he's in handcuffs so um, did it really warrant shooting in a parking lot full of people? Exactly. That that would be the question. And was he a threat when he's running away from you? No, it wasn't. Yeah. And if the officer probably had even said, shots fired, but they're my shots, I'm firing at suspect, it could have been a different outcome because then the person pulling up wouldn't have thought there's somebody out here shooting at one of my comrades. Um, and I, I need to get out trigger happy, but rather I know I need to find my comrade that's doing the shooting so that I can make sure that I'm not in the line of his fight. Yeah, absolutely. And, and then when I look back at it, like the, post, the top of the article said, a $46 door knob, $45.87. That does not warrant to me to take some a young man's life. And like I just said, I feel like Maybe maybe it was the headbutt, and then after that he he got upset about it. But then for him to and he fired eleven rounds, and McCree didn't fire any rounds at all. He didn't no shots were fired at no all. No shots, from what we're told, no shots. And I think I read in the um, Post and Curious article 
one I've read so many lately that um, McCree actually returned to Walmart with the intent of paying, paying for yep. the object mm -hmm. and um, was being escorted to the loss prevention room. So, you know, so many scenarios and I guess it's easy for us to come up with the differences and how things could have gone differently because we weren't there. But at that moment, there were so many ways that that situation could have been handled differently. Yeah. When we think about a small town such as Chester and community policing, you knew who he was, you knew where he lived, you knew where he worked. There were so many other ways that this person issue a warrant, pick him up later, let him run all day, run till he's out of breath, mm -hmm. can't run anymore. <laughs> we coming to get you, son. Exactly. You know, you, you can run, but you can't hide, so to speak, because we, we've identified you. Mm -hmm. So, um, but no, I, yeah. I don't believe that there is anything in Walmart. The, the entire store and all of its inventory is not worth the life of an individual. I agree. I just have a hard time seeing, seeing him with bringing the money back to pay for it and with the intent to shoot the kill or anything. Like, to me, I just have a hard time believing that. And one of the things, you know, with these situations around African Americans, what they love to do in the media is, They'll go back, and I don't know Mr. McCree at all, mm -hmm. but what they'll like to do is they'll go try to dig up anything, whether he had any issues in high school or whatever, and just try to make it seem like that fits the narrative of why he committed this crime. Right. And none of that stuff just pertains to this incident should, should not even matter. Right. And, and for it to be over a donor that he was returning to pay for, should he have been arrested for stealing, then that, that's a different story. Right. But to take, take his life for something like that, while he was in handcuffs, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't. It doesn't make sense at all. And that's why I said right is right and wrong is wrong. Um, were there some better choices that Aaron could have made? Certainly there were. But should they have um, led to a death sentence? No, they should not have. Absolutely. In my opinion. I agree. Now, if I, now, correct me if I'm wrong now. The investigation is still going on. Did they reopen the case with the sled or... Honestly, I have not received official notification that the case has been reopened at the federal level. I know that the Attorney General, um, um, Alan Wilson, has made that request that the Department of Justice look at it. If official notice has been received by the City of Chester, no one has um, alerted me to that, mm -hmm. um, to that fact. As a matter of fact, in conversations with the attorney that is representing the city, um, on last evening, he said that um, as far as he was aware at this point, the um, request had been made, but um, he had not been notified that there was actually a federal investigation taking place. How Do you have any type of uh, interaction or kind of relationship with uh, Chief Williams? Do y'all have any kind of contact, like communicate with these kind of situations? or? I think it was evident from that um, press conference the right. kind of communications the chief and I have. Right. Um, um, no, I don't. I don't work with the police department on a day-to-day -day basis, um, and as well as any other department. You know, with the department heads, I, I I do have a much better working relationship, I would say, with the other city department heads than I do with the chief of police. Um, not really sure why that is, to be honest with you. Um, I know that both of us are, he appears to be a very headstrong person. Um, I know that I can be equally as headstrong and stubborn. Um, and so it, it, I don't have an answer for why, but um, they're just, it just does not exist. Um, we typically allow our department heads to run their departments and um, report directly to our city administrator. I work um, very closely with the city administrator on a daily basis um, with her um, as we work together and re you know report back to council. So, um, so no, I'm, I don't work with the police department on a daily basis. And probably right now I'm not the favorite person right. <laughs> of, of the police department, but that's okay because with leadership, um, you, you're charged to, 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 to do exactly that, and that is to lead. And if you are a leader, you have to make tough decisions, and you have to do what you believe in your purview is what is best for your community at the time. And the, 
the decisions that I've made, um, the emotions that I've made to terminate police, and my belief that the police chief should resign from his position mm -hmm. is what I believe is in the best interest of this community at this time. Absolutely. So I, I read earlier um, this morning as well, like the vote that you had to come to it fell four two to fire the officer. So what happens next in this in this situation? Anything else that you can do, or is it kind of like you have to let it? Um, race? because I was on the losing end of that, it would require one of the people that voted um, on the side that won, one of those four people that can bring the issue back up and can put it back on the floor. So it's not a dead issue. Mm -hmm. um, last night, um, the four that didn't vote to terminate said they didn't have time to do their research. They didn't know enough about the case. Um, they didn't know enough about the SOP um, and what it said. I don't want to bash my counsel by any means, but you've had seven months to mm -hmm. find out as much as you can about this case. Um, I only video, saw the video Thursday myself, but mm -hmm. that's what common sense that using the brain that God gave you, you know, to do your research, ask those questions, and um, be able to make tough decisions in a heated time. Are you going to catch heat? Of course mm -hmm. you are. There are probably as many people that don't want the officers fired because they think it's okay to shoot a handcuffed man in the parking lot of Walmart. They're fine with that. Okay, oh, he went in there, he walked out with something, shoot him. That's not the solution, you know. Um, so, But there are just as many, if not more, people in this community and nationwide that sees a problem with an officer that does not follow established protocol that's in your standard operation procedural manual. So, um, you, you were selected to lead. You were elected exactly. to lead. And you were elected to make hard decisions when you're sitting in the hot seat. Absolutely. You know, and so I would, um, I would just hope and pray that the council is going to see in lieu of the fact you brought out the point from the Post and Courier, you've got someone that has uh, habitually done this. Mm -hmm. And so... Not having his camera on yep. Exactly right. And it's okay? Exactly. So what what is the standard that we're setting? Mm -hmm. That That's the question. What is the standard that we're setting? And what is the precedent going to be? Will there have to be more occurrences of citizens coming forward? And then when we go to say, okay, pull the video footage, where's the body cam, and it doesn't exist, where does the greater liability lie, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the liabilities for this community, this city? And, and, uh, and, just, and just for me on the outside, to me, like, that, that bothers me as well when you said for the vote, that you said that they didn't even look at it and they had seven, six, seven plus months to look at. To me at this point, you just don't even care if you haven't even attempted to, to look at the footage. It's like you should, in these kind of positions, it should be some account, some kind of accountability because you you have to to pay attention to this kind of stuff, especially when somebody, when a family a family member is taken away, like a, a young black man. But it's like, are you do you even care about what's going on when you don't even look at it, but you just vote? So it's like, and just me on the outside, I read I read the articles, I watched the, the footage, and it still doesn't add up. And I was like. These people have to, they have to take these kind of situations very serious. Yeah, and even at the end of the day, and as I told counsel on last evening, the, it, the, it's not a black and white issue. Mm -hmm. It's not about black, a white man shoot black man. Um, all of the other factors that, that exist, you know, will still exist. Did Aaron go in Walmart and pick up something, walk mm -hmm. out the store with it? According to them and their video footage, he did. Did Aaron go back to pay for it by their own admission in their statements? He did. Um, what took place from there? Could some better choices have been made? Certainly. Absolutely. On all parties' parts. Every party involved. There could have been better choices and decisions made. But for my counsel, for my counsel, are you going to adhere to the established standard operation procedures? 
that you have voted on to accept as a council for the city of Chester? Or are you going to willy nilly be like the wind and whatever blows in, we accept then when the when the wind changes course, you, you drift over there and you're going to drift back over here. You have to stay the course and there is a reason that these policies are put in place so that people can be held accountable. And where does the accountability come into place if I am not going to be held accountable for not following established procedure? And that, that is what this is about. Um, the officers not following established procedure. You know, the rest of that, it'll have to play out in the court of law. Um, but the one thing that was very simple that our council could have acted on last night, which would have at least given this community um, some indication that you are willing to do what is right and that you are willing to hold people accountable when um, they are not um, performing and navigating within the scope and sequence of what their job says they should be doing. And um, I believe as a council we failed our community on last evening. And it, it only dampened the, the, the level of mistrust that um, the community has with regard to policing and government, period, at this point. Because when, when, when your electors go out and elect you, they are electing you to be that voice that is going to represent them and their needs and to, to listen to them. Now, if there was nothing to base this on, I would not even be raising the issue. Would not be raising the issue. You know, because I've sat quiet. I've sat quiet for a while because I was told no one's going to discuss this case with you. There's a gag order. We're not going to give you any updates, what have you. I accepted that. I'm okay with that. Actually, that's good for me. You know, that it was, that it was done that way. Because at the press conference that you won't explain every play, play by play and um, frame by frame, I had the opportunity to ask those questions that I, that came to mind when I viewed a video just the, the previous day. You know, I didn't call the press conference. The police chief did. And the press conference is open to the public, is it not? Um, so, as the mayor, I attend the press conference and I ask the questions that a lot of other people were wondering. So, the bottom line here for me as the mayor is, were there procedures that are established by the city that were not followed or adhered to? And from everything that I can read, and I'm, I'm a pretty intelligent person, um, it says the policies were broken. They were not adhered to. And so why council couldn't see that? And I, I guess maybe they needed a paper copy in their hands. Because I do have one council member that says she doesn't like people to read anything to her. She likes to read it for herself. All you had to do was ask for it. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, nobody stopped you from asking for a copy of the standard operation procedures. Now, matter of fact, that council person told me they were busy reading several 800 page um, standard operation procedural manuals because they wanted to make sure that um, they would have they were sure they would have questions and disagree with me on the citizens review board um, that I was going to put forth before the council. So if you read several and I quote 800 page SOPs, the city of Chester should have been one that you was reading. Absolutely, I agree. Now, now, had, had had it been the other way around, where you had the majority, you guys had the majority vote for two, would they have been automatically removed from? Yes, from they would have been. I need your gun, your badge, and anything else that you got on on the desk tonight. Mm. But when you report in the morning, you get somebody to come drive you to work, bring us our car, park it, so you can have a ride back home. How, how much, uh, just wondering, how much diversity is it in those decisions? Because is it, is it like a split or is it kind of like, because a lot of times, for me, we don't have faith in the system because in some of these positions, it's not we don't see a lot of us in these positions. It's like, a, is it a mixture or how, how is it? My council is predominantly African-American. Mm -hmm. 
um, there are uh, there are nine of us, eight members of council and the mayor. Um, there are four wards in the city of Chester, and each ward has two representatives. Um, from Ward 1, we have Councilman William Buda Killian and um, Susan Colvis. From Ward 2, we have um, Angela Douglas and um, the other council person from that ward, that, that seat is vacant now because um, she, Councilwoman Badley, um, passed away a few months ago. So there, there's a special election that's going to be held, I think, July the 14th to fill that vacated seat. Um, from Ward 3, there are um, um, two members of council, um, Councilwoman Annie Reed and um, trying to think of the other person in that ward, Linda Tinker. And, and then Ward 4, there are two council members. Councilman Carlos Williams and Councilman William King. Now, you did not hear from Councilman King on last evening because there is a court injunction against him right now where he cannot actually come into council chambers or attend a council meeting via Zoom or what have you and serve as a sitting council person and it's some legalities that took place before I got here, something that happened with him before he was even a council person. So I don't even know what all that is. Um, and so that puts us down to people. The vacated seat by death, um, I'm gonna say the dysfunctional seat at this point because Councilman King cannot act, actively participate. And um, we had one council member that was not um, in attendance at the meeting, Councilwoman Linda Tinker. Mm -hmm. So um, of that council, only two members are, are, are Caucasian, and that would be Councilwoman Susan Colvis and Councilwoman Linda Tinker. Everyone else is African American. Okay. Just a few more questions, and then we'll get ready to wrap it up. I know we we taking a lot of your time, but um, something else that's been talked about, and we we spoke about it in our last interview with. Uh, Chief James is defunding the police. Um, what do you think? In my opinion, I'll go ahead and say I don't know if you guys would do it, especially with the way they say the cameras are, they have old cameras, but defunding the police. And one of the things they were saying was a lot of people were saying, well, maybe if you take a little bit of money from the law enforcement and you just distribute it in your community to, to help better your community, what are your opinion on like defunding the police? Honestly, I don't. I don't believe in defunding the police. Mm -hmm. I, I recognize that the police play a very important and pivotal role in the community, mm -hmm. and I hope that no one misconstrues um, where I am with the police. Right. Um, we need public safety. If there were no police and public safety, there would be chaos everywhere. Right. Um, so I do support good governance and good policing, honest, above board, accountable policing. Um, but I, I don't support defunding the police department. If anything, if there's one of the departments, if I could put more money into it, it would be the police department. Um, and just by virtue of the fact that we need um, new body cam, that I believe the chief said um, on last evening, um, they cost about, it would be about $7,000 per car to upgrade, mm -hmm. to get it where it needs to be so that when the blue lights come on, your body cam, the audio and video automatically initiates. I'm going to be begging industry in this community um, to please, please um, donate some money. If we can get seven, every, every $7,000 we get goes to upgrading a police car in the city of Chester. Mm -hmm. Now the chief says last evening that, oh, well, I'm glad you asked that question. And within light of what's going on in the community now and all across the nation, oh, yeah, there's funds available uh, to do this. Well, why the hell haven't you done it? Exactly. Excuse me. Oh, you're fine. But, you know, if you know it's money out there, and damn it, you know your police department is living back in the Mayberry days 
with um, mm -hmm. Andy Griffin and Barney, then bring them up to standard. Mm -hmm. Why are we still using equipment that is subpar? And you know it. Resign. Resign today. Exactly. And like I said, for me, I just have a hard time believing that with footage, like with these cameras, they, they just don't automatically have sound with it for some reason. Like, in, like I said, you can go buy, you can go to Cricket, you can go to Walmart and just buy a basic smartphone and it has sound. So how come these cameras don't come with it? To me, it just seems a little, it seems a little iffy and then having so much time pass before this stuff comes out, to me, it just doesn't add up. And then, like we said, with the officer having these, this history of not having this camera on, it's all this stuff just does, just doesn't even add up. So, like you said, like like he start like chief, he has to hold some kind of accountability as well. Um, he needs to handle these situations, and I don't even think the officers were reprimanded in, in any type of way. Like they were still able to work. So a lot of it just it's just very unfortunate, and something uh, hopefully we can, some kind of some kind of uh, decision will be made soon. But just a couple more before we get out of here. Um, Back to being a mayor, how do you feel this this term is different from the ones previous that you served? <laughs> um, honestly, just having a different um, a different makeup of council, mm -hmm. um, and the challenges with regard to um, the national publicity and and having a police officer um, related death right now is, is probably the biggest difference. Mm -hmm. um, when <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny that you ask that because coming back onto council, we've been talking about some potential housing development. And one of the council people that has served with me um, through a previous tenure as mayor um, said to me, if only we had listened. You know, you brought a proposal to us 12, 15 years ago, and where would we be if we had only um, had that same foresight and that, that, that vision and had grasped on to the vision that you presented to us at that time? You know, um, so still dealing with the same types of issues, and those issues are how do we evolve Chester? How do we get our citizens over the sense of apathy that they possess? Um, you know, right now there's a lot of fire and passion that exists uh, because of the national attention and the national platform that's taking place. Mm -hmm. But once COVID-19 um, tucks its ugly head and people go back to their... Um, football platforms, basketball, and all the other activities, I need you to remain just as passionate about what is happening in this community. So really, it, it hasn't changed a whole lot. Um, same issues, honestly, just a different set of people by which I'm working with. And that was one of the things that I ran on, that um, my council um, lacked leadership. Um, the council would sit and discuss things, but nothing was happening. And um, and, and I, I see that now with even my, my leadership. You know, um, some people want to talk about stuff until they wear a hole in the floor. But all you're doing is sitting in council chambers or you're in a Zoom meeting and you're just talking. Right. You got to put you got to put some work behind it. What, what does it say? If, it, if you don't, it's dead. You gotta faith put some yeah, dead. faith without work is dead. Mm -hmm. You gotta put some work behind it. Um and and I'm gonna give you an example of that. On last evening with the um Citizens Review Board, um, one of the things that was proposed is that when we come to appointing that the city administrator appoints one member, the members of council, the eight members of council would each appoint a member. And then the mayor would appoint two. I had a council person that said, well, um, I have a problem with that. What, what's your problem? Well, I think if you get the, if the mayor gets a point two, then that's like the mayor having um, 
someone that's going to push her agenda along. There is no agenda. This is a citizen's review board to help hold the police department accountable for what's happening, um, to give us a second set of eyes. But yet, you want to be like a child in the candy store um, where her sucker's bigger than mine. Um, or the, someone gives you a cookie and they say, well, I'm going to have to break it in half, give you half and give you half. And where her half's more than mine are the glass of um, Kool-Aid. The little child, you can fool them by putting a little bit of ice in it, and it makes it look like they actually have more in their cup than they do. And um, so, you know, don't stop looking at things with a chase, you know, chase eyes, jealousy, or or envy, or you're getting more than me. Look at what's good for this community. Now, what I did do is I went to the city of Greenville, I went to Charlotte, I went to Columbia and Charleston. All of those communities have citizens review boards. Every mayor on those boards, some of the mayors um, appoint three or four people. I only said let the mayor select two. Um, now in all of the time that I've been working to pull this together, not one council member since I announced that I was going to present this has presented anything Nothing, nothing, not one idea, not one anything to go towards the formation of that board. But when you're presented with something that you know already works because it's already in place, you're upset because it might get, it's going to give me one more point T than you. What's, what's for the good of this community? So, you know, my response to that is the mayor doesn't have to make an appointment, period. That won't bother me. Right now, what I need is for this council to agree to vote positively to move towards establishing this board. Absolutely. You know, who appoints whom is not it even a matter. factor. Exactly. Before we get out of here, what, what would you say, what's the plan going for for us as, a, as an entire community? Because we, we see the protests, people are taking a stand, um, getting out, we have to get, of course we have to get out and vote, but what would you say is next for, for the people in the community? Because we... Like you said, we can't just rest on our laurels now. Like we have to keep voting, the, the protesting, and, and I'm not with. I don't agree with all the looting and everything, but it's, things are starting to turn around. I get the George, the George Floyd situation definitely made an impact. But what would you say is the plan going forward for for everybody? I believe the plan going forward should be civic engagement. You've got to be civically engaged in your community. Um, and in doing so, you can hold your elected officials accountable. Um, you can hold their feet to the fight. Um, you've got to be not only registered to vote, but you've got to get up off your butt and go to the polling place and vote. Um, no excuses. There are no excuses. Um, you know well in advance when election day is, and you know your working schedule. Uh, many times the excuse that I get on election day is I've, I had to work, um, I didn't get off on time, or um, by the time I get back to Chester, the polls will be closed. The polls are open probably before you leave to go to work. Um, if not, then there's always the absentee balloting that you can do. And some people say, well, I don't trust that process. I'd rather you trust that process to, to get your vote in than to not go vote, period. Absolutely. So trust the process of absentee voting. You can actually walk in and absentee vote and drop your ballot in a box if you don't want to mail it back in. But um, civic engagement, I think also um, at the forefront of this, we're going to have to have some more leaders on a national level that, that steps forward. And... Um, I don't want to say necessarily carry the load for for our people, but the type of leadership that is needed. You know, um, back in the day we had a Jesse Jackson. You know, um, what keep hope alive. Mm -hmm. um, we we had the um, well, and we still have Reverend Aaron Sharpton, and we still have um, Reverend Jesse Jackson, who are older in age in our community. As I forestated my dad. From the time I was probably six or seven years old, following him around, and his thing was, 
I've got to train somebody that's going to be ready, um, you know, your warrior in training mm -hmm. to be ready to, to step up to the plate when the time is right. Um, we've got to be um, engaged in, in teaching our children. Um, like your son, I have enjoyed seeing him this morning. I think it's driving you crazy. Yeah. But um, I, I guess the, the teacher part of me um, is enjoying just seeing him here. And as he works with your cameraman, he, you know, he's, he's moving, but he's learning everything that you're doing. I bet you he could go back through this interview tonight with you just like clockwork and, and is learning how to work these cameras. We've got to be engaged with our children. So um, it does my heart good to see him. And you don't, I know you don't even realize the lessons that you're teaching right. him by allowing him to accompany you. Um, but it's beautiful. It, it, you are to be commended, both of you, because your cameraman has been patient and allow him to look in over in there and adjust things every now and then. But being civically engaged and getting our, our youth and our children involved and at an early age so that it's not something that's just thrust upon them, but something that has been embedded in them. That same um, fabric that I said I believe is woven into my spirit, I have also worked to embed that into my children. And my children, if they have children, um, I want them to weave that same fabric into their spirits so that there will always be someone that is ready to answer the call. But I think that's the biggest issue that we have. You know, we've got the achievement gap, we've got social injustices, um, an array, a slew of problems, but they're not new. Mm -hmm. They're not new. When we had schools separate but equal, so to speak, um, my mom often told us about the lessons of they'd have to walk to school, the other kids were on buses, but they walked every day. My grandmother had eight children, sent every one of them to college. She, um, she was a teacher, she, she taught kindergarten, but even before doing that, she worked on the weekends um, cleaning um, the houses of, of, of white citizens so that she could make sure her daughters had nice crisp dresses and the, the bowls to go in their hair and the nice shoes to wear. Um, they made those sacrifices. And as parents, if I could say anything basically to wrap this up, I implore parents to become more actively engaged with their children um, and, and to know what's going on with them because we, we are losing a generation of children. And I won't say necessarily to the street, but to video games, mm -hmm. um, to the social media that exist. We, we need to be 100% involved, so much so in your children's life that when they cut on social media, you pop up. Yeah, because um, that's how I got into social media when my daughter went off to um, Virginia State University. I was like, well, I got to know what that child's doing you know, up in Virginia. Right. You know, I've <laughs> got to be sure that she's still on track. And so, gosh, there's just such, there are so many things. But I, I believe the most important thing is um, civic engagement, being involved in your community at every level. Um, to affect change. And as community changes, we'll see our um, counties, we'll see our state, and then we'll begin to see national levels change. But it, it begins at the local level in civ civic engagement. Absolutely. Like you said, we, we have to get involved, get out and vote. Like, and come November, we have another big election. And not this is another story for another day, but we we see the type of things that the, the chief, the man in charge, has to say. We see everything that he says and, and how he feels. So that's another story for another day. Right. But so so please go out and vote. Um, let your voice be heard. Serve the community. Um, please serve the community. Take care of one another. And Miss uh, One, I want to thank you again for taking the time to sit with us. Um, before we get out of here, is there anything else you would like to say? Um, no, I, I appreciate your time. Thank you for um, coming in and, and giving me an opportunity to speak to the community. And um, I look forward to seeing you again. But if um, nothing else, um, my prayers for peace and um, peaceful protest.
um, and that justice is served on mm -hmm. every level for anyone that, that has been wrong. Absolutely. Well, thank you again, and you, you're more than welcome to come sit with us anytime. Also, Chief Williams, if you watch this interview, you're more than welcome to sit down and have a conversation as well. But hope, hopefully everybody has enjoyed this interview. You learned something from it. Hopefully justice will be served. But until next time, keep chasing the dreams. This is the Cross the Line Podcast. Thank you for listening.